Okay, everyone, we are recording. Let's get started. Greetings and a very warm welcome to tonight's virtual lecture brought to you by the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art, Louisiana chapter. Tonight's talk is volume nine, Carrollton, part of the New Orleans architecture series, focusing on that sector of New Orleans where American troops led by General William Carroll encamped during the War of 1812. I am Kevin Harris, president of the Louisiana chapter. In addition to lectures, the ICAA hosts educational workshops, travel programs, and all as part of our mission to advance the appreciation and manifest the principles of classical and traditional architecture and its allied arts by engaging practitioners, students, educators, and architecture enthusiasts of Louisiana. If you are not already a member, please consider joining and help us continue to offer these wonderful programs. You can join by visiting our website, www.classicist-la.org and clicking the join tab. You also won't want to miss signing up for our next lecture, which will be this Sunday, June 27th at 4 p.m. when Mary Campbell Gallagher will present her new book, Paris Without Skyscrapers and presents a very compelling case to save the skyline of Paris and historic cities worldwide. I want to thank our ICAA program committee for making this event possible, and especially Courtney Coleman, Kelly Calhoun, and Peter Patu. Now to introduce Robert Cangelosi Jr., our special guest behind tonight's event. Robert is the current president of Coke and Wilson Architects based in New Orleans. He's an architect and an architectural historian with a focus on the preservation, restoration, renovation, and adaptive reuse of historic structures in both Louisiana and Mississippi. In addition to running a successful architectural practice, he also teaches design arts seminars throughout the country, instructs tour guides for Friends of the Cabildo, and lectures at Tulane University on New Orleans architecture. Volume 9, Carrollton, is his latest book. However, Robert was also co-editor of Volume 7, Jefferson City, and Volume 8, The University Section. To purchase these, please visit www.1850housestore.com collections. A uh, slide will be, uh, Robert will end his presentation with this website and the phone number to uh, call and uh, order your own copies. Please join me in giving a warm welcome for tonight's speaker, Robert Cangelosi, Jr. Robert. Thank you very much. Um, some time ago, I was um, working at my office and I got this phone call from Dorothy Schlesinger and she says, your boss, Samuel Wilson, Jr. has volunteered you to start working on these books. And I figured, well, if my boss volunteered me, I better start doing this. Um, I had always uh, loved the New Orleans Architecture Series books and had used them and all, and I'm very fortunate to be able to have continued the tradition of these books. Um, this is volume nine of the series. Uh, volume 10 is currently in production. This is the 50th anniversary of the series of the books. Um, when the Friends of the Cabildo started doing these books, uh, there was no Preservation Resource Center in New Orleans. There was no Historic District Landmarks Commission. There was the Louisiana Landmark Society, but it was a lot of the same people involved with Louisiana Landmark Society that were involved with the Friends of the Cabildo and they spearheaded this preservation movement. Um, and as a spinoff of some of the Friends efforts through the books and their building watches tours, the Preservation Resource Center was done. And the Friends focused not on neighborhoods that were well known initially, the Garden District, the French Quarter, they went into neighborhoods that needed preservation. The Friends wrote a book, it became a National Register District, then became a local city district. So the Friends were very influential in spearheading this movement. Uh, some of the pioneers of this would be Mary Lou Christovich, Sally Reeves, Rula Teledano, Samuel Wilson Jr., Bernard 
Ned Lemon were all very involved with these books and they were involved with many other preservation organizations and so forth. Um, Mary Lou Christovich told me a lot of the books was written in her um, house on the lakefront uh, in her office up in there. Now, this is the most recent in the series of books. The first in the series was the Lower Garden District, uh, which was done in 1971, so it's 50 years ago. It was followed by the American Sector, or Volume 2, uh, which was done the following year. Initially, they were coming out pretty quickly. There was a debate as to how these books should be written. Should they be coffee table books or they should be scholarly books? And the decision was made to somehow bridge the two types of books in here. The earlier books tend to be more general in nature. This building is of this particular period or style. And now we're getting a little bit more specific with exact dates. The cemeteries in New Orleans needed a lot of attention. So volume three focused on the cemeteries in 1974. It was followed by the Creole Faubourgs, which would be um, all the, the suburbs around um, the French Quarter there, Marigny, Treme, New Marigny, and so forth. The next book was volume five, Esplanade Ridge, which in New Orleans runs from the Mississippi River on out to Bayou St. John. It came out in 1977, followed in 1980 by Treme and the Bayou Road. Jefferson City was the first book that I really got involved with. In fact, Dorothy Schlesinger's husband, Junie Schlesinger, said I was over at their house so much working on these, he was going to claim me as a dependent on his taxes uh, because I was there so much, eating so much of their food. Um, but I worked with Vernon Lemon, Sally Rees, um, and um, Dorothy Schlesinger on this particular book. And this is the first one I was involved in, which was followed by the uh, university section, volume eight in um, 1998. And then, of course, that takes us to the Carrollton book. Um, I wound up doing this book pretty much by myself. I did have some assistance through students and so forth. Um, a lot of the people had passed away. Um, Sam Wilson, Bernard Lemon, Mary Lou Christovich, uh, some of the people working on the book had also passed away with the production of the book as it was going on. And I wound up being the sole editor of it. Um, I began before Hurricane Katrina. Uh, one of the few things I took with me when I evacuated before my house flooded under 10 feet of water was the manuscript for the Carrollton book. Um, and a lot of the research materials, such as the Carrollton newspapers at Tulane University, went underwater in the basement of the library. This particular book, the area of New Orleans it covers is the Lower Lawn Street, the Mississippi River, Monticello Street, and the current I-10. This land was originally owned by the city's founder, Bienville. He was granted all the land from the French Quarter all the way through the current Jefferson Parish boundary in 1719. He operated his land as a feudal lord in which he let people work the land in exchange for some of their crops, some of their animals and so forth. Many of the Germans, it was originally given to uh, these concessions or, or usage of the land was given to Germans and French. Many of the Germans will eventually move further on up the Mississippi River to what we call the German coast between New Orleans and Baton Rouge in 1775. Now Bienville gets recalled by the monarchy back to France. And when he comes back to New Orleans, he tries to reclaim his land, but the royalty had passed a law saying, um, they wanted not one person to own so much land. They wanted it subdivided on up so there'd be more people here in Louisiana developing it. And this is the map that Bienville has prepared to show that he did in fact have people on his land and they were producing and they were uh, sort of developing between New Orleans and Baton Rouge. Now over time in 1728, Nicolas Chauvin de Lafiniere and a man simply by the name of Adam is going to acquire the lease on this particular uh, part of his concession. Um, at an unknown date, it's going to go to Chauvin's son, Louis Lebreton. In 1781, John McCarthy, who is the, who is the tutor of Lebreton's children, is going to get control of it. And then 1808, 
Louis Edmond and Marie McCarthy, who's the wife of Paul Lanouse, is going to get in control of it and they will be the ones who will sell it to developers which will ultimately subdivide it. In many references, it's known as the McCarthy Lanouse land. Now here you see in this map here, this Fuchsia would be where Audubon Park is today. And this is what is today's Carrollton. You'll notice Bayou Metairie coming through here. That is Metairie Road today. You'll notice these now gone um, remnants of bayous um, throughout the uptown area of New Orleans. The original McCarthy Plantation House was located at the Mississippi River and Clinton Street. That area doesn't exist anymore. It's been consumed by the Mississippi River. Now, as you've already heard, General Carroll and General Coffey encamped on this land when they came to assist Andrew Jackson during the Battle of New Orleans. And Carrollton is actually named for General Carroll of Tennessee, who will become their governor and very influential politician in Tennessee's history. In fact, um, the state of Tennessee loaned us uh, the portrait you see here for the book, as well as some of his documents to be included into the book. Now, when Edmund sells off his land, he will ultimately, his portion of Carrollton, is going to build the McCarthy House you see here, which was Andrew Jackson's headquarters actually during the Battle of New Orleans. So the family had already started selling off shares of this prior to the Battle of New Orleans. Now, the real developers of Carrollton will be Bernard Maroney, who developed the Maroney section of New Orleans, Samuel Cohn, Lawrence Milledon, John Slidell, who Slidell, Louisiana is named for, and the New Orleans Canal and Banking Company. They will hire a German immigrant, Charles Impel, to lay out the plan for Carrollton. Carrollton Avenue today was the route of the Chauvin Sawmill Canal, just as in the Creole Faubourg of town, Elysian Fields was the Marigny Canal Water was taken from the Mississippi River and this would power their sawmills and that's why these canals were dug. Carrollton was initially called Canal Street. When Zippo lays out Carrollton, he comes up with this concept of these super blocks, which you could buy a super block is you see in the lower left corner over in here. Then you subdivided the super blocks into four municipal squares within the city. Then each municipal square got subdivided further and further until uh, you got the more typical lots uh, in New Orleans. Now, um, Zimple Street in Carrollton is a misspelling of Mr. Zimple's name. Uh, Zimple Street in New Orleans is spelled Z-I-M-P-E-L where the man's name is Z-I-M-P-L-E. Um, Short Street was named for one of the um, lumbermen in New Orleans. The upriver, downriver streets were, were numbered streets, and the river to lake streets were named for American presence. And of course, when Carrollton gets annexed, New Orleans already had a lot of streets with the same name. So a lot of them had to be, uh, their names had to be changed over time. Important factors in the development of Carrollton will include the New Basin Canal. During the Spanish colonial period, the Spanish government had built a canal from Bayou St. John to the back door of the city of New Orleans, which is today known as Basin Street. This was a way to move goods and ammunitions very quickly from the Mississippi Sound on into Lake Pontchartrain, then down uh, into Bayou St. John, then into this back door to New Orleans, which was much quicker than fighting the current of the Mississippi River. Remember, there's really no power then. They're relying on sail vessels from the mouth of the river on up to New Orleans. Now, that was in the Creole portions of town. In the American portion of town, above Canal Street, the American interest will build the New Basin Canal in 1838. It went from Lake Pontchartrain on into about where the Superdome is today, and there was a turning basin there. And this was dug in 1838. And it is going to be the company that develops this canal is the one that is one of the developers for Carrollton. They're going to be pushing the real estate in Carrollton in the development. Today, I always think of going to Carrollton down St. Charles. 
people back then went from the city of New Orleans on out the Shell Road along by on along this canal here, which is today the Pontchartrain Expressway in New Orleans, or they went down Canal Street and came in that way, crossing the canal, as opposed to following St. Charles Avenue. Another major factor will be the New Orleans and Carrollton Railroad. Um, this railroad was established in 1835. It was about a 40 minute ride from New Orleans to Carrollton. Uh, it was originally a true railroad line pulled by steam engines. It went on out to the town of Carrollton. Later on, it's going to be mule drawn. Um, then after the 19, after the 1884 World's Fair, they demonstrated that the streetcars could be electrified and eventually the streetcars become electrified. And off to the right here is a schedule when they left Carrollton and when they left New Orleans, showing you the times that the railroads ran. At the Carrollton end of the railroad was this wonderful Gothic Revival building designed by James Gallier. The first building was built in 1835. It was destroyed in a fire and it's replaced a few years later by the buildings you're seeing here, for which we have Gallier's original drawings and many uh, photographs of it. Unfortunately, the oldest part of the town of Carrollton has been consumed by the Mississippi River. The earliest buildings, the old streets, the main street in Carrollton is all now in the Mississippi River. Carrollton was sort of a resort community for New Orleans. So they had this Carrollton Hotel, which was built there. The first one built in 1840, then the fire hit in 1842, it's replaced. And you can see these various photographs and drawings of the hotel. This, people would travel from New Orleans out to the hotel for concerts and for just um, having ice cream, political rallies, all sorts of things took place here. And they talk about in the newspapers of the time, just get out of the city and come on to this nice, lovely town of Carrollton there. In association with the hotel was the Carrollton Gardens. These were based on the Niblo Gardens in New York City. And these surrounded, as you see in the plan here, of the Carrollton Hotel and the Carrollton Gardens, um, and these were very lush gardens and lots of different activities took place. Here you see some of the concerts that took place there. There'd be circuses that would take place there and so forth. Now, Carrollton is offered for sale primarily through the Arcade Exchange uh, on Magazine Street in downtown New Orleans. And the lots are offered for sale or these super blocks are offered for sale. Now, part of the problem was Charles Zimple's survey for Carrollton was screwed up royally. And a lot of the streets, as they begin to develop, are misaligned. And there's a lot of lawsuits and battles which will go on for the alignments of the streets. Carrollton was never a very large city. As you see in these maps here, this is sort of the master plan for Carrollton. But all these little dots down up in here, those are really only the buildings. Here's a blow up of it here. You can see there's not a whole lot of development here in 1855. In 1878, after Carrollton is annexed, this would be St. Charles Avenue here. This would be Carrollton Avenue here. You see many of the streets don't even exist. This would be Claiborne Avenue back up in here. So the area was very sparsely developed even after it's annexed by New Orleans. Here are just some more maps showing the evolution of Carrollton and here in 1894, you can still see how sparsely Carrollton is and how many of the streets aren't cut through. Carrollton really does not explode in development until after it becomes the seventh municipal district of the city of New Orleans. Carrollton is a village. Now, Jefferson Parish is carved out of Orleans Parish in 1825. New Orleans starts taking back parts of Jefferson Parish. The Garden District was the parish seat of Jefferson Parish at one time. It was taken back. They moved the parish seat to Jefferson City. Jefferson City got annexed by New Orleans. It was moved on to Carrollton, and then Carrollton gets annexed by New Orleans, and we'll talk a little bit more about the annexation a little bit later on. But as a, as a village in Jefferson Parish, between 1833 and 1845, it's an unincorporated area. Between 1845 and 1895, it is an incorporated town in the parish of Jefferson 
and becomes a city in Jefferson Parish between 1859 and 1874. To give you an idea of how sparse Carrollton was, in 1843, there's only 10 stores and there's only a thousand residents in the area. We jump to 1869, there are 200 stores and about 4,400 residents in the town of Carrollton. That's just prior to annexation there. So it was never a very large area. Here, once again, you see the dots indicated uh, actual buildings there. Levy Street, which we'll see illustrations in a little bit. This was the primary business area and the levy gets moved on back. One of the main reasons for Carrollton being annexed is Carrollton's levies are always failing. And when they fail, New Orleans floods. There are many Carrolltons in New Orleans. Sometimes I got excited. I found on eBay, I thought I had some china from the Carrollton Hotel in Louisiana that I was going to acquire for the State Museum. Turns out it was for another hotel in a different Carrollton. And you see from Alabama to Virginia, there are 13 other communities with the name Carrollton. Carrollton being its own city had many mayors from John Hampson all the way to Albert Bryce. Albert Bryce is the man in the upper right corner in the lower left corner down there. Uh, this is Henry Gogreve. Carrollton is, is unlike New Orleans, it's settled primarily by Germans. They're not going to be Roman Catholic there. They're gonna be mostly um, um, Protestant face establishing the area there. There will be the Catholics and so forth, but these are mostly going to be German men and they're primarily going to be in the lumber business. In the notarial archives in New Orleans, a one of a kind in the nation, we have some illustrations of some of the early architecture in Carrollton. The first house was built, we're not quite sure, 1834, 1835 at the Mississippi River in Carrollton Avenue. Once again, that area is gone. It's just completely consumed by the river. We were able to trace some houses. Uh, for example, this house you see here, sort of done in this federal taste, gets remodeled to this appearance over here in a more Greek revival taste. And the earlier architecture will have these very formal French parterre gardens. Later on, they'll become much more naturalistic gardens in an English taste there. From the notarial archives, here we've got some nice classical architecture in here for residences. And here we have got a, um, a coffee shop or a euphemism for a bar or a beer garden or a beer saloon there. And being lots of Germans, there were a lot of these beer gardens located in Carrollton. I love this example here with this Belvedere with the classical top, the attic windows and the entablature up in here and so forth. Most of the fences in the early period are going to be wood as opposed to uh, cast iron, which will come in at a later period in time. A few of the older examples of architecture did survive till the period in which there are photographs, but once again, images you're looking at today no longer exist. Now, this was Levy Street. This would be the Mississippi River right here. This was all the early businesses in the town of Carrollton. We have these great Greek revival commercial buildings seen here and here, although they look the same, they're two different buildings. This all gets wiped out when the levy is set back. There's a very bizarre Louisiana Supreme Court rule and is when they move the levy back onto all these buildings here, they had to demolish the buildings. The owners of the buildings were compensated for the demolition of their buildings, but not for their land. Louisiana Supreme Court said, you still own the land. It just happens to be underneath the levee. You can't use it or anything, but you still own it there. Actually, I thought it was a really bizarre ruling that the state Supreme Court had done to these people. The businesses, once again, in Carrollton are going to be primarily in lumber. A quote in 1847, the sale of wood seems to be the principal employment of the inhabitants of the town of Carrollton. And here we see the Fisher Lumber Yard over here and other examples of businesses working in lumber. If you look at the businessmen of Carrollton in here, you look at primarily German names that are the business people developing the town of Carrollton. Did get into entertainment to the, Car to the Carrollton area. Uh, the Floating Palace stopped in. Of course, a lot of these things are heading to New Orleans and this is just one more stop. They probably go to New Orleans and Baton Rouge and Donaldsonville and all sorts of places. Uh, one of the more interesting characters that performed in Carrollton was Dan Rice. He is the prototype for our Uncle Sam. 
Uh, the term jumping on a bandwagon comes from the fact that he was with the circus and he supported um, Zachary Taylor, the only president to come from the state of Louisiana, and they jumped on the bandwagon that Dan Rice was leading through this political um, parade. Uh, Dan Rice was the first celebrity to be in any Mardi Gras parade. He was in the first crew of Rex here in New Orleans, and he was more widely known in the 19th century than Mark Twain was. Horse racing was very popular in the town of Carrollton. What is today is the Metairie Cemetery was a racetrack right located right here. Here's the New Basin Canal coming through here. Canal Avenue marked here is Carrollton Avenue here. This would be Canal Street, Bienville Street. This would be going on back to the Carondelet Canal in this area of town. Here you see after it's developed is a racetrack there. Um, the Metairie race course will be an early Confederate camp and that's where the state of Louisiana calls men to arms uh, at the camp when it gets settled. I talked about holidays and um, celebrations in Carrollton. The history part of the book is confined up until Carrollton is annexed in 1874. The architecture, because there's so few from that time frame, goes all the way through buildings very recently. Talked about how um, Christmas was celebrated in Carrollton, and today we hear about Juneteenth and all, but in both Carrollton and New Orleans, the passage of the 15th Amendment to the Constitution, that's when African Americans celebrated on April 30th with these big celebrations, great political, moral, social, industrial revolution with the passage of the Constitution. And so this was a big event. Of course, I'm showing the Carrollton Parade here with the mule drawn things coming off of Oak Street onto Carrollton Avenue. Um, this is, of course, out of my time frame. And Carnival was, in fact, celebrated in when it was a separate city. Did look into the newspapers that Carrollton had, all the way from the Carrollton Star in 1851 to the Carrollton Sentinel in 1873. The Library of Congress, I found some of these newspapers there. They said Tulane, unfortunately, they stored all their newspapers in the basement. And when Katrina hit, those papers got flooded. They had to be sent off to uh, conservators. What they do is when they're flooded, they freeze them, and then they dehydrate the water on out so they could be used. Being a city, we got into municipal improvements. This was the Carrollton Market. There's a park right here on Dublin Street. This was originally built in 1848. Streets are always a big concern with Carrollton. There's a lot of contracts being let for streets being paved, either in planks of wood, uh, dirt. Streets were never very good in Carrollton and really don't get improved till New Orleans takes on over. As I mentioned, levees, are critical to the development of Carrollton. And here you see the water coming up against the levees in here. Here are men resetting the levees when they're moved back in the early 20th century. Up in here, you can see, I found this image on eBay, believe it or not, when I was working on the book. And I knew immediately when I saw it, they had it unidentified that this was in fact Carrollton. I saw other images of this little pavilion right on the levee there, but this is really the key there. They just said um, somewhere on the Mississippi. And um, because of the failures of the levees, New Orleans will work to annex Carrollton. When levees failed in the Carrollton and in the Riverbend area of Jefferson Parish, you see on this map here in 1847, the water goes all the way into the French Quarter. So Carrollton was never maintaining the levees, and so New Orleans was always sending men and money, even going into the Spanish colonial period, for the maintenance of the levees there. This is the setback, the last major setback of the levees in which we lost this older part of Carrollton. And a lot of these streets in here also get lost as the levee is set on back. Got into religion in Carrollton. Uh, as I said, the earliest churches are not Catholic. The first church, I would have thought it would have been Lutheran, but the first church is Methodist Episcopal. It's established in 1843 in the town of Carrollton. These are some early images for the various churches in the town of Carrollton. Um, Catholicism will take over eventually in Carrollton in there. And this was some of the developed, the priest, Father Prem, that got Monte Della Rosa developed. It was interesting that I learned that there were several Catholic churches developed there, some primarily settled by uh, uh, the parishioners were primarily German, and um, some were primarily French. 
And when the Franco-Prussian War breaks out, it breaks out in the congregation. They split up. There's fights between the different sides of the congregation, whether they're going to have a French uh, pastor speaking French or whether they're going to have a German priest speaking German. And it gets very complicated as uh, religions sometimes do. The Daughters of Charity, I was able to get this from them, operated an orphanage there. Unfortunately, this building is not there. Here you see the nuns. Some of you may remember these are the nuns that ran Charity Hospital in New Orleans, and they're always known for these big uh, winged habits that you see there uh, on the nuns at each end of the girls there. The New Orleans and Carrollton Railroad was instrumental with the development of Carrollton, but Carrollton was sort of to be a hub community of the railroad. We have the Jefferson and Lake Pontchartrain Railroad established in 1853, running from Carrollton on out to not West End, but East End in New Orleans, which really doesn't exist anymore. At Lake Pontchartrain, there were also more hotels and resorts and restaurants out there. And then the New Orleans, Jackson, Great Northern Railroad ties into Carrollton, tying New Orleans, Carrollton into the rest of the nation, going on up through Jackson, Mississippi, then on up to the Midwest there. The courthouse will be established. It is the Paris seat. The courthouse is designed by Henry Howard. Um, the contract for this building is today located in Jefferson Parish's courthouse, which is in Gretna, Louisiana today. Uh, the building today is being adaptively reused um, for a senior citizen center. It one time served as a McDonough school, as you see in the lower left. There were other police station buildings, as you see in the lower right there. Sam Wilson told me, and he grew up in the neighborhood here, that he actually witnessed hangings in the courthouse grounds here at one time for prisoners being executed. There's also a very interesting legal case that this one man is a grand jury convicts him or indicts him for murder before Carrollton is annexed. When they go to court, it's annexed. So the defense says, well, wait, 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 you can't get a grand jury indicting one person in one parish and having convicted in another. Because the Supreme Court rules somehow for judicial reasons, Carrollton was still part of Jefferson Parish but for municipal reasons, it's part of Orleans Parish. I don't know how they come up with some of these rulings, but you'll need to get a lawyer to explain all those to you. Of course, being a city, we will have schools uh, during this time frame. You'll have them for both boys and girls, whites and African-Americans. This one still stands on Fern Street and it was built in 1854. Of course, the appearance you see there is a early 20th century renovation in this craftsman taste there. They'll have their own cemeteries as well. In 1843, what was originally designated as Green Square, which was to be a public square, becomes the parish, or uh, rather the city cemetery. Now, during the city Civil War, following the capture of New Orleans, Farragut's going to take his fleet on up to Carrollton. And you see here in the lower right, some of, or there was Fort Morgan, on the jet on what is today the West Bank or Jefferson Parish side of the river. And there was embankments or uh, fortifications on the east side of the river. I got into some of the Civil War um, activities here. This is uh, the Metairie, um, today the Metairie Cemetery was the Metairie Racetrack. This becomes an early uh, camp for Confederates to congregate here before they move on out. This is uh, General Bear. some of the other uh, Confederate generals that were associated with the area. Camp Parapet, which is, which is in Jefferson Parish today, it runs pretty much along um, Causeway Boulevard. The powder magazine, which you'll see in a little bit, is still down here, and it had a line of fortifications that ran out into the swamps. It was originally built for, to defend the city of New Orleans following the War of 1812 for another foreign attack. There's a lot of very good documentation, diaries of what happened in here, the disease that's taken place there, and all the activity from both um, Confederates and Union soldiers there. This is getting into the Union occupation in here. This is what's left of Camp Parapet still out there. It's a powder magazine there today. Um, the 9th Cavalry 
is established in Greenville, Louisiana, which is today basically where Tulane Loyola is. And these African-American troops will then go to Carrollton before they go out becoming the Buffalo soldiers serving the American uh, West. Um, there were a lot of white military leaders that refused to lead African-American soldiers. Uh, and some are, will be well known by their name. Um, they did establish a communication station, as you see in the upper right over here, excuse me, uh, upper right here, that had a teller of uh, this signaling by lights to a signal station on top of the United States Custom House. And I just happened to find this on eBay too and knew exactly what it was from some of the um, correspondence and so forth. Here you see these letters being published from Camp Parapet. And so we've got really good documentation of it. Now the annexation of Carrollton is going to go from about the close of the Civil War till 1874. It gets embroiled in um, the politics of the time frame. There's all these secret meetings which take place. And one time, the Times Picayune in New Orleans, or the Daily Picayune writes, New Orleans better hurry up and annex Carrollton before the entire state of Louisiana is annexed by Carrollton because there were plans of, Carrollton kept taking in more and more land of Jefferson Parish. They had gone all the way through St. Charles Parish that they were gonna to annex to New Orleans. And ultimately, they'll fall back in 1874 to Monticello Street which is still the boundary for Orleans Parish today. But when I went to the state Supreme Court and read all of these state hearings, and there was a lot of them held in secret, it's, it's really embroiled in typical Louisiana politics as to what's going to go on and who's arguing for this and who's arguing for that. There was an architect by the name of C. Milo Williams, and his brother was a great photographer. And here we have some very interesting photographs of Carrollton. In the lower left over here, this is actually ice. There's icebergs on the Mississippi River here. Here we see the snow in New Orleans. This is the ferry landing, which went from Carrollton across the river to Gretna. Here you see all the snow, some boys and some of the flooding onto the Batcher in here. Some early photographs of Carrollton um, from various different sources. Um, Avis Ogilvy, whose ancestors were key in the development of not only Carrollton, he paved Carrollton many times, the Hoy Brickyard. Much of the Hoy family land is, was not annexed by Carrollton at all, but this is the family house in Carrollton, one of the oldest surviving houses, and she was a big benefactor um, for this particular book. Just so you know, everybody that works on this book is unpaid. The only paid person in any of this was the photographer. All proceeds go to the Friends of the Cabildos to support the Louisiana State Museum. Here are some houses, all of which have been lost except for this one, a great house, which I was able to find. The architect was copying a mission in Texas for the inspiration there. I actually found this was an architect's home. I was able to find the drawing and so forth. It's really based on an architectural pattern book house. Some of the non-residential examples of this was a nursery, a Piggly Wiggly grocery store. This was right at Earhart and Carrollton. This was a um, cistern plant, the New Orleans and Carrollton Railroad, the streetcar barn, the New Orleans um, water works there, which is falling apart. Uh, a building which still stands today, which is the former post office for the town of Carrollton. Notice the flooding here in Carrollton. This house still stands in Carrollton with it's done in this Tudor Revival style. This Gothic Revival house is one of the oldest surviving houses in the town of Carrollton. This is the illustration on the front of the book. This house is Sam Wilson's boyhood home. That may in fact be Sam Wilson in the front of the house there as a youth. We have some great interior illustrations, not from the town, time of when Carrollton was a separate city, but around the turn of the 20th century, all taken by C. Milo Williams, uh, which are housed up at Tulane University. We went through architectural drawings in various archives of the various buildings, uh, the Spanish eclectic on the right, and a little um, um, Romanesque revival on the left side there. Uh, Notre Dame Seminary 
looking like a big French chateau in Renaissance revival banks and the lower images there. We got into the prairie influence here. The best prairie style house in New Orleans is located on Ferret Street. Arts and crafts homes, Thomas Sully's home, the New Orleans architect on Carrollton Avenue done in a colonial revival style. Um, we found that a lot of houses were taken out of architectural pattern books from all across the country. We were able to document many of these particular houses. We gave the history of a little over a thousand houses in the book there. However, only 123 are from the 19th century. The rest are all 20th century houses. The oldest is on Maple Street. It's seen right here, 1845. The newest is on Claiborne Avenue and one on Dante Street as well as Monroe Street. They're all done in 1950. So that's the range of the time frame of the structures documented by the book. And I'm gonna go over just quickly some of the houses in the book here. And we've got the dates that they were built. Here we've got a nice a little a late Italianate house with the mansard roof and the wonderful crestings in 1872. This Queen Anne house in 1905. Um, I don't think it's very successful. Uh, the post office took this old Cloverland dairy done by um, a New Orleans firm and um, they insisted on a one story building. So this transition, the terracotta front was saved, but the rest of the building was not saved. This was the Cloverland dairy. Uh, this is Mathis Briere's firm did the um, post office in the back and their firm is the one when it was um, under a different name, did the front portion of the building there. 1881 on Maple Street there. Early 20th century. This house unfortunately did not survive Katrina. It's done in sort of an early prairie style. This was the home of Andrew Jackson Higgins, who did the landing craft um, for which the World War II Museum is based around. Here we've got two a Dutch colonial revival houses from the early 20th century. Late Italian eight off to the left side, 1891, moving into a little bit East Lake there in the late 19th century on the right side. We were able to find some Susan Roebuck houses in the area. Susan Roebuck offered um, several catalogs of concrete block houses. In fact, they had patented a concrete block machine. Sometimes it's referred to as patented stone and you get these rock face concrete or CMU units you see off to the left over in here, which was very popular in New Orleans in the first decade of the 20th century in this craftsman style. And we've got a little bit of Mediterranean style of 1926 over there. Mediterranean Villa, it's heavily influenced by Charles Platt's designs across the country. And this was originally built as the home of the destitute orphan boys, now known as the Waldo Burton Memorial. 1870s on the left and 1900 on St. Charles Avenue there. Notre Dame Seminary. Seminary. Allison Owen is the architect of Allison and Owen. Um, Allison Owen was, um, Owen Zabal, I'm sorry, is the firm name. Allison Owen was a general in the American artillery fighting in France during World War I. He sees all these French chateaus and he'll build for the Catholic Church this huge French chateau when he returns following World War I. Off to the left, we have got Southern Colonial Revival. And then off to the right, we've got Greek Revival, the same inspiration for these both of these classical buildings, but we are a half a century apart there, time-wise. This is the house that we saw the little person sitting on the porch. This was uh, one of C. Milo Williams' designs for his brother on Carrollton Avenue. It's interesting the way the side of the house keeps stepping out as it moves on up. A little hard to see it here. There's some half timbering in that. This light blue is not very appropriate to the um, palette of the period when this would have been built. Mission styles in here. Um, a house done in the style. It did. We found an old photograph. There was a quadrifold window in here. This gas station, 1923, that's been since demolished since the book was done. This was a uh, drugstore. This was, I'm told, the, had the last soda fountain in New Orleans in a drugstore in here. Later, when I was doing the book, it was a Cuckoo's, which was kind of appropriate, Spanish food, Spanish building. 
Um, it's, it's changed this, when this photograph was taken, it was a Japanese restaurant, not quite sure what restaurant it is today. Mata della Rosa, Roman, I'm sorry, me, Renaissance Revival there, 1909. Great house on St. Charles Avenue, 1887. It was a riverboat pilot that had this house built. Notice the nice decorative terracotta ridge tiles up in here with the trifoils in there. This house was very interesting. We were able to um, document its evolution. And uh, there was an estate sale. Now I went not to buy anything, but to see the inside of the house and to confirm our speculations. This house is originally built in 1895 is a one and a half story house. In 1927, they lift that house into the air and add a ground floor and try to make it look like Mount Vernon. The better rooms in the house are on the second floor because that was the original portion of the house there. We get into the California style and the craftsman style with a lot of these bungalows being built in town. And there's some very fine design homes during this early 20th century period. We looked at very modest churches located throughout the neighborhood here being built a year apart. The architect for this house is a very interesting person. Um, his name is H. Jordan McKenzie. He gets the name, nickname Blue Roof McKenzie in New Orleans because he designed his house in the German Austrian Sessionist style with a bright blue roof on it. We were able to, when I teach my class at Tulane, I show he follows the work of, of Joseph Olbrich. He saw Joseph Olbrich's interior designs at the St. Louis World's Fair. And when I teach my class at Tulane, I show Olbrich's design and Mackenzie's designs. And you can see this man is stealing all of the designs. Uh, he, he names his architecture as Mackenzie-esque is the term he uses, but he's clearly following the Austrian Art Nouveau accessionist style. Up on the left, we've got a second empire style building from 1880. And on the right, we've got a Tudor revival house built in the early 20th century. The legend is built on Leonida Street. There's We've got all these problems with our sewage and water board plants here in New Orleans. And uh, President Biden just came down here is talking about infrastructure repairs and all. The story we were told in the neighborhood was that contractors building all the houses here were going across the street, stealing all the materials, all the stucco, all the materials for the construction of the water plant for the building of these houses. And this is one of them that supposedly the materials were stolen from the city to build. This is another one of the examples that H. Jordan McKenzie designed. This one's on Carrollton Avenue, the very interesting sort of mushroom rooftop there. This is the oldest surviving house in the town of Carrollton on Maple Street, 1867. I mean, 1869, 1879 there, both Italianate houses being built in the uh, Carrollton area. St. Charles Avenue, 1905, Tudor Revival, even though it lacks the half timbering in that, that's the only real style you can call it with the Tudor arches here and some of the Tudor parapets there. House over here is from the town time frame of Carrollton. The house over here will be outside of the time frame of Carrollton. We generally in New Orleans think of Creole cottages being in the French Quarter and the Creole Faubourgs. In reality, we found a lot of Creole cottages still standing and or archival evidence of their existence that are now gone in the town of Carrollton. There's also a lot of Creole cottages in the Irish Channel, which to me was kind of surprising because you don't expect this Creole influence in these Anglo portions of town. Uh, some Tudor revival on Carrollton Avenue. Late Italian 8, 1904 there. Now, Carrollton today is both a National Register Historic District as well as a City of New Orleans Historic District. The boundaries, as you see in these two maps, are slightly different there. According to the City of New Orleans, Carrollton is made up of many neighborhoods. They are 73 official neighborhoods of New Orleans, which goes anywhere from, they call it Black Pearl, East Carrollton, Leonidas, Marleyville, Fountainbleau, Girttown, Hollygrove, Dixon, uh, neighborhoods in there. Um, the name Black Pearl 
When Curtis and Davis was commissioned by the city of New Orleans to do the community development neighborhoods in the city of New Orleans, they did a survey of the residents that lived in this neighborhood right here. And they said, what do you call your neighborhood? The African-Americans in their neighborhood called it N-Town. They couldn't use such a derogatory term, so they made up the name Black Pearl. And I keep getting this question, where did Black Pearl come from? Where did Black Pearl from? Well, Curtis and Davis made up the name. Um, I've done the same thing when creating a historic district. The state hired me to do Mid City, but they didn't have enough money to pay me to do the whole thing. So I divided what's now the Lafitte Greenway, and I came up with the name Parkview, created it for the other side they couldn't pay me to do. Sam Wilson made up the name Lower Garden District. Uh, according to period accounts, the Lower Garden District um, had a different name at the time frame. Um, I'm trying to think of the name, it's escaping me right now. Um, that they use the term there. Part of this area is called Girt Town. There was a Girt's General Store there. The neighbors called it. Um, there is a street called Holly Grove from which they take the name there. Now Marley, Pierre Marley was a free man of color who subdivided this area. And we're looking at the area right up in here in 1834. Mr. Marley was a little ahead of his time because the drainage system wasn't in place and this land was constantly flooding. So by the early 20th century, the Louisiana Supreme Court declared this abandoned palmetto fields and turned the ownership over to the city of New Orleans um, because no one ever did anything with it because it was constantly flooding there. This is the back image of the book. Uh, Jimmy Blanchard did both the, um, the Carlton Courthouse cover for me in the back of the book. This is a wonderful Gothic Revival house, uh, one of the older houses in the town of Carrollton. And so we were very fortunate that he let us, uh, he loaned us the images for uh, the front and back cover of the books there. Um, so the books can be ordered from the Friends of the Cabildo at 1850housestore.com, or you can call them, it'd be 504-524-1918. Uh, the retail price is $59.95. However, if you're not a member of the Friends of the Cabildo and you do join, um, at friendsofthecabildo.org, uh, you get a discount on the, the sale of the book there. So that's an extra benefit, and you also can attend to a lot of the other programs that the Friends do. I'm going to be want, doing one uh, in a couple of weeks on how to research your house in Louisiana to get the history of the house. So that's my quick and dirty of a lot of years of work on the book. And um, let's see here if I can get... Uh, We've got some, let me see if I can get to the chat in here and get some questions in here. Come up here. Were Americans the people who inhabited, inhabited early Carrollton or uh, immigrants? Um, they're both Americans and immigrants that are coming in. Uh, New Orleans is a port of immigration. There's a lot of Germans and there's uh, books written on the German immigrants into New Orleans and so forth. And so some will actually be Americans and some will be immigrants on into the city of New Orleans. Um, is that railroad cutting across the city, uptown to downtown, still there? Um, there is a railroad line which runs across right at Earhart. Um, the other railroad lines that were further on up on that map there, what the railroads gave up the line that was there, which became the Lafitte Greenway. That's early, in the late 19th century, they proposed putting a bicycle path at that early there. And that was the railroad line once the state filled in the Crondelet Canal. So I'm not quite sure whether that was the rail line that you're talking about. There is a, a rail line which does go through around Earhart still. A lot of the railroads were rerouted during World War II for moving of ammunition and so forth uh, during uh, of men and so forth. When was the Carrollton Courthouse Jail demolished? Um, I'm not really sure. I can't tell you off the top of my head when that happened. The drawings for the courthouse, the jail, the, excuse me, the jail are up at the New Orleans Public Library. Um, the hill picture in the hill pictured in the armory storage looks very similar to a Confederate monument in Metairie Cemetery. Um, oh, oh, the, the hill pick, that was the, um, that's the um, Camp Parapet. 
that hill is really the reason for that is that's where they store the ammunition and to prevent from it from blowing up you put dirt all over it so if it exploded it didn't go all over the place there was a powder magazine like that just outside of the Wall City, New Orleans, and Magazine Street takes its name for it. It did blow up at one time, and we do have the French colonial drawings for that. Yes, it does look like one of the um, monuments or, or tombs out in, a Confederate tomb out in the cemetery there. How do you find what pattern books the houses came from? Are there signatures that you uh, become familiar with? Um, just by doing this by profession, you kind of look at something and you're suspect of it. And I then go to the pattern book. There are um, some websites that do pattern book houses and they show them across the country. Actually, they have taken the Sears and Roebuck pattern houses and it's called Houses by Mail. And they tell you what years the designs were published in and where they found them in the United States. I have found websites that will document pattern houses, which I use in my class at Tulane. They show me the pattern book house and they show me New Orleans. And I was able to do about 20 of those. There's one right around the corner from me. I live on Carrollton Avenue, but in mid city, that is a season Roebuck house right there. Um, there's no way of really knowing it. You kind of get your suspicion sometimes uh, knowing what they were doing, like there was an architect by the name of George Barber out of Tennessee. Believe it or not, there is a house on Audubon Place, one of the most exclusive streets on New Orleans historically. They've got a catalog house there. Um, horrible job. Well, thank you very much. Um, what like is that, in reference to one of the buildings. Classical sure. revival. That term is um, um, interchangeable. I use the term Southern colonial revival because that's the term that I find being used in period um, <laughs> literature at the time frame. The architectural magazines out of New Orleans, architectural art and its allies refers to it that when I read the newspapers, they're describing it. That is the term they use. A lot of people use also classical revival. However, when I've seen classical revival used, they're talking about Greek revival or federal style, which is using Roman classical de details as opposed to Greek classical details. So um, Southern colonial revival is the late 19th, early 20th century. Generally, I've seen classical revival to be 1820, 1830, 1840s. Um, hopefully that answered that question there especially at the beginning of the presentation before showing the individual houses, more maps would be very welcome by those of us who are NOLA fans, but not as familiar with Carrollton. The maps are all in the book. So buy the book, <laughs> you have all the maps right there. This is just the summary in there. Maybe you are talking about, no, in the presentation, those maps are all in the book. So you can study there. I heard Black Pearl was named for Louis Armstrong's lady lover who lived in that neighborhood. Ha, you, no, that, that's, that's simply not true. Um, thank you, Richard, for your comments there. Um, uh, thank you for the comments there. What streets are currently in place of the former location of the New Basin Canal? That would be the Puncher Train Expressway, I-10. It, uh, as it continued towards Lake Puncher Train, that's the Greenway West End Boulevard. Uh, it's green there, but it continued all the way. The lighthouse out at Lake Puncher Train was the navigational, um, location and beacon for the new basin canal to get you to come in a lot of goods such as bricks tar pitch lumber came in from the north shore across lake pontchartrain then came down lake pontchartrain then came across lake pontchartrain into the new basin canal to about where the superdome is today i remember when they did the anniversary for um uh, the building of St. Alphonse Church. One of, the, one of those legends was is the ladies carried the bricks in their aprons from the Mississippi River to the site to build a church. And I said, Father, you're wrong. They had been coming from the other way. These are all North Shore bricks. And these would have been coming in from the other direction. He said, don't tell anybody. It's going to ruin my old ceremony there. But um, a lot of the goods were brought in that way. So the New Basin Canal would be the... Well, I think they still call it the Puncher Train Expressway. They may have changed it to the Reverend Ar Avery Alexander, but it's the I-10 that goes from Jefferson Parish until it comes into New Orleans and then turns at the Superdome there. Uh, but it would have continued to about the Superdome. And as you go towards Jefferson Parish or Baton Rouge, it would have continued toward Lake Pontchartrain down West End Boulevard. Um, 
those are all the questions I have here. If there's anybody wants to unmute and ask a question, I'll be glad uh, to answer it. I just wanted to clarify that the horrible job comment was meant for them doing that post office and wrecking that building. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Yeah, well, it was the same firm. Uh, it was, um, I'm sorry, I'm having senior moments here. Um, it was um, Favreau and Liveday. Favreau and Liveday that originally designed it. Then it's Mathis Briere that did the renovation, but they were forced to doing that. Interesting story is the post office originally purchased the um, wonderful Art Deco general laundry building with the intention of demolishing it. Preservation has said, you can't do that. It's in violation of the National Preservation Act of 1966. So they go by this building here and duh, you made the same mistake post office. You've got another building, which is uh, either on the register or eligible for the register. So, but yeah, it's, I don't think it's a very uh, successful um, merging of the two in there, um, but they were given a very difficult challenge to kind of uh, wed a one story with a two story building there. And was that, was that a, a dairy farm previously? Yes, there's a lot of dairy farms in that part of town there. And in fact, uh, a lot of that area, when you look at the early maps, is all dairies. And when you see uh, some of the early houses in the town of Carrollton, they were dairy farms there. Um, Rivers along, an attorney with Jones Walker, his family owned a lot of the land around where. Um, Xavier University is today, and it was a lot of dairy farms out in there. As I said, people used to come in that way into the town of Carrollton, not down St. Charles, until St. Charles Avenue was created. They're going to be coming the other way, and there's a lot of dairy farms out there. A lot of people, older people, told me they remembered that the, the cows all still being out there. There was a former reporter for uh, the Times Picayune that she died in 92, 93 when I was working on the, no, it was 103 when I was working on the book. And she kept talking about Tin Can City or Silver Can City. And she said it was a dump there. And it got that name because of the reflection of the sun off of all the cans there. Um, and I looked high and low to find that term in period literature or anything like that. But I simply couldn't find that term. But Yes, there were a lot of dairies there. Yeah, so they talk. Yeah. Um, a question about the uh, pattern books. Did you ever use the Sloan or the Alexander Jackson Downing books? Were they used at all? Uh, not for the town of Carrollton. They were used in New Orleans for other things. Okay. Um, Carrollton just didn't have that kind of wealth or um, sophistication. Oh. Um, there were some nice, we saw some nice Greek revival houses there. But no, I didn't see anything like that. Now, yes, those books, I've got original copies in my office of those books that have been handed down. Actually, we claim they were established in 1916, but Richard Koch's father worked for architects, uh, William Fitzner, all in New Orleans, and we can trace a direct lineage back before the Civil War, and those architectural books have been handed down from generation to generation. I've got original copies of those books in the office. And yes, in doing work, I go to those and find uh, patterns, uh, the Caffin House, Miss Carl, the Haunted House in the French Quarter there, I found a European pattern book that all the details were lifted on out of there in this empire style, not second empire, but empire style. And so um, not in Carrollton, but in other parts of the city, definitely Sloan and Davis and all those people. Mm -hmm. um, Interesting. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, Robert, uh, on on behalf of uh, all our listeners and the uh, ICAA Louisiana chapter, thank you, thank you. This was an awesome presentation. Uh, you've helped uh, further confuse, or I guess straighten up some of the confusion of uh, looking at uh, historical documents, uh, roads in uh, New Orleans that have similar names and have changed, and uh, the uh, you've documented and explained extremely well. Uh, what's happened with the uh, the section of Carrollton? I can't thank you enough. I encourage everyone to uh, uh, purchase the book, and also for the ICA chapter. Remember, this Sunday at 4 p.m., we'll have another presentation by Mary Campbell Gallagher, 
and she presents her book, Paris Without Skyscrapers. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, say thank you again and good night. Thanks everyone. Thank you.